discovered in the same, I think it's Swedish, but Scandinavian mining town. Um, There's actually six elements discovered in that small town that had like 10,000 people living in it. Um, there were six different elements and there were, uh, I believe, so Scandium was one of them because it was named after the fact that the Sweden's part of Scandinavia. There is a Scandinavian country. So Scandium, Yttrium, Yterbium, Erbium, they dropped off the first syllable from the, the town's name was Yitter. And so they dropped, so it's Yitrium, Yiterbium, Erbium are all straight from the town's name. They were not being very creative with that. And Scandium, um, and there's a couple more. I don't know, it's, uh, I actually just learned that last week because some new, you know, a uh, new story popped up on my new tabs page on Firefox or something like that. Um, so that was, I thought that was pretty interesting. Maybe premium? Anyway. Um, all right, let's get going on. Uh, talk about today's lecture. So we're gonna talk actually in, in kind of today's lecture, just for an idea of what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of um, some vocab terms, conceptual things. Um, when it comes to macroscopic, I've been doing conceptual stuff for microscopic quantum scale stuff. Today we're going to start talking about macroscopic things like phases, solid liquid gas. Um, talk about some of that. You're going to get it in more detail when we cover the phase change chapter. Because just being able to look at something and say, well, yeah, that's a solid, um, that's not all that helpful. But we have to kind of have that vocabulary in order to describe some of the, the properties that we're going to talk about when we get into talking about compounds. Um, and so then we're going to talk about the difference between a mixture and a compound. And then we're going to get into describing different types of compounds. We're going to start with the simplest kind, which are ionic compounds. Uh, let's see. Oh, OK, random space questions. Um, since we left this one on there the other day, what are the odds that there's other intelligent life forms in the universe? Seems like just by chance humans were able to come about. Yes, um, there is that that probability that that life evolved totally randomly on Earth, um, and that was a pretty long shot. So if you look just statistically speaking, but the law of large numbers and the fact that there are billions upon billions of planets in the in the universe just within our solar or just within our galaxy in the milky way there's billions of stars that each have a you know a pretty high probability of having planets if you just run through the different numbers of what you know okay even be conservative with some of these guesses um if you this is a link to a page called that's well, pink it's interesting um, the Fermi paradox, um, which is the, the uh, basically Fermi was thinking about what's known as the Drake equation, which is basically if you take all of these different factors uh, and multiply them all together, if you treat all of them as probabilities and multiply them together, then N is the number of, of um, let's see, the way he's officially phrased it number of technologically advanced civilizations in the Milky Way, where R, R star is the rate of formation of stars, F is the fraction of those stars with planets, N is the number of planets per solar system, F sub L is the fraction of suitable planets whereupon organic life actually appears, F sub I, you see how you just basically take, make all these assumptions and work backwards from and say, okay, well, we only have a sample size of one, but we could guess that Let's just throw out wildly, throw out a number there and say the probability is this for the likelihood of habitable planets. Um, and we're getting better numbers for all of these, right? All the, all the work that the James Webb Telescope is doing and a lot of those other, what's the other big one that um, was looking at the extrasolar planets um, before James Webb got 
got launched and operational. Um, now it was, it was post Hubble, basically it was the one that was looking at the gravitational wobble in the stars to deten determine if there was a planet around that star. Um, but basically we're, we're honing in on what are decent guesses for all these different factors. And, but the, the thing is, is that R and F are both so big that, um, and the number of, of, or the size of the Milky Way is so big that it seems like there should be other technologically advanced life developing just based on sheer probability, um, which is the fact that we don't see that is what's known as the Fermi paradox, right? So the story goes that, that Fermi was sitting in the lunchroom at the Manhattan Project by himself and he was thinking about all these things about, you know, apropos of nothing, just in his spare time, he was thinking about extraterrestrial life and he, he just sort of blurted out and interrupted everybody that was talking about work around him. Just, where is everybody? Um, and so it's the, the Fermi paradox is kind of an interesting question um, because it seems like we should, there are this probabilities of extraterrestrial life. Why don't we see more evidence of it? Um, and there are a couple, there are a couple options for that. And I think it's an Arthur C. Clarke quote. It's, um, there are two possibilities, either we'll, we're alone in the universe or we're not, and both are equally terrifying. Um, and, uh, but basically it comes, it comes down to, it's really unlikely we would ever actually have any contact with any extraterrestrial life because communication between the stars is limited to the speed of light. And the closest star to us is four light years away. So we'll take four years for a signal to get here. But the bulk of the Milky Way is, the Milky Way is I think 10,000 light years across. Um, and we've only been looking for signals from other planets since about the 1950s. So there's been about 60 years out of the history of humanity that we've actually been looking for these signals. It's entirely possible that there was a civilization that evolved before us way far away that sent out signals trying to communicate with people that then went extinct or decided it was worthless to try and send out those signals and stop sending them. And they stopped you know, 100 years before humanity even knew to start looking for these radio signals. And so the odds that two technologically advanced civilizations exist at the same time and close enough to each other to actually be able to communicate is really pretty small, just because Milky Way is such a big space, big place. Okay. I read that if there was extraterrestrial life, like it would be so far away that the just like that they would be looking into the past. Mm -hmm. So like it, they would be seeing people in like how they would like it would take and not only be a thermal 100 light years away, right? Or 300 light years yeah. away. But they could be 10,000 light years away and they'd be seeing woolly mammoths. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really civilizations and species rise and fall at such a short time frame relative to astronomical distances and astronomical time frames that it's just really um it'd be a lot more likely to find, if we ever found a way to travel between stars, to find evidence of a civilization that was long extinct, um, or that another civilization finds us in a thousand years from now, and we're totally extinct, or moved on, or look totally different. So it, it's just a really, it's a really big hypothetical that's really interesting to think about, but it's really hard to keep in mind, man, space is really, really big. And there's almost nothing in it when you look at the distance in between stars and the distance in between planets. It's so vast that it would just take forever almost to actually do any of that travel, you know, you know without some pretty big changes the way we understand physics. Yeah. You know, uh, so like the, the educated part of the educated guesses for these probabilities, like, mm -hmm. you know how those were established? So some of them are, so if you go to the, the um, Drake equations on page, so the, he has a list of what are the original estimates versus the current estimates, um, and it gives sources for how they determine that. Um, and some of the ones that are the biggest, 
Um, the biggest wild cards, so to speak, where are they? There they are. Um, are we don't really have much. Like, we have no idea what the fraction of civilizations that develop technology that, that can release detectable signals. Like we're really just guessing there. And that's, and so it's kind of makes sense to kind of take two options. Like, okay, what if every civilization that reaches a certain point eventually gets to using radio waves versus what if, you know, 0.001% of civilizations actually ever reach that point? And then that kind of gives you like sort of two boundaries that you could consider this would be the most likely versus the least likely estimate. Um, and there's also, there's a lot of um, sort of science philosophy, it's not really science philosophy, but a lot of speculative science that talks about things like what's known as great filters. There's likely a series of really important events that have to happen for any, any sort of form of life to ever reach um, a certain point and it's some of them are going to be really difficult like maybe life is really 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 common in the universe but only at the single cell level and only one out of every 10 million planets that has life actually gets past the single cell level and then once you get past that only one out of 10 million that make it to the to the multicellular life <coughs> makes it to um conscious life and out of those, almost all of them make, render themselves extinct for various reasons before they reach technology stage, right? And so those are what are known as the great filters. And it's really, just, it's one of those things where the, the species would have to make it past a certain threshold before they render their thumbs extinct. Um, and those are, we're all just sort of guessing, but there's a couple of really obvious places where, well, that might be a really unlikely event. And you know, for instance, making it off of one planet and to another planet within the same solar system might be a really, really big deal because then if something happens to Earth, there's still humans living. Um, but again, now we're getting into the realm of, of science fiction. Um, than actual science, but it is fun. Guess yes, about black holes. And so I've kind of talked about the Big Bang uh, during that. I, during is the wrong phrase. Before the Big Bang, the universe as we know it existed as a singularity, meaning it was basically like an asymptote in space time. You think of Einstein thinking about how um, you can visualize, let's see if I can actually draw this, things that have a lot of mass as having sort of this, this effect where they sort of pull down on space time the way that a bowling ball on a bed kind of creates a depression and attracts everything towards it. A singularity or a black hole is when you pull this down so much that you have an asymptote um, in, in the mathematical sense, where effectively it doesn't quite, I don't know if we could describe it as tearing the fabric of space time, but it basically like, it's stuck th that way. And the thing about singularities is that the all of the science and math about general relativity and special relativity and all Hawking's work indicates that at a singularity, um, time doesn't exist. So if time doesn't exist, cause and effect doesn't exist because you can't have cause and effect if you can't have a before and an after, right? And so if you were to survive entering, you know, crossing the, the event horizon of a black hole, you would encounter the, the surface of the singularity where upon time would cease to exist for you. You wouldn't, I don't know if you could call that entering a black hole or becoming part of a black hole or what that would actually look like. Um, because the thing about black holes is the nature of them being a singularity means no information even can be released um, to the surroundings. So, we don't know, but it would be really weird. And um, you would be living in an a-causal environment if you were still living. You'd be living in a place where time doesn't exist and cause and effect doesn't exist. There's no such thing as cause and effect. Um, if you could even consider events to happen, they would all be happening simultaneously. Um, but more likely it's just like nothing is happening because happening implies time, right? 
So it's, it would be really, really weird. And it is kind of a fun thought experiment. Our language is not even set up to be able to communicate these ideas because our language inherently has cause and effect built into it. Um, so it's, it's really, I try to be really careful when I discuss things like this because I don't want to imply time even when we're talking about this. And that takes a lot of conscious effort, um, which is kind of fun. All right, let's do some conversion practice. We've been doing a lot of conceptual stuff, um, electron configurations, things like that. Let's get back to doing some conversions because we're going to come back to conversions here pretty quickly. Ethanol has a density 0 0.789 grams per milliliter and a chemical formula. How many moles of ethanol or how many moles of ethanol are in 0 0.750 liters of ethanol? Give this a go and I'll start working through it in three minutes or so. Yeah, we never explicitly said that, but we did it with salt back in when we did the goldfish problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, so same approach. If you've got a molecule that has more than one atom in it, if you want a mole of that molecule, that means you've got two moles of carbon and six moles of oxygen and one mole, sorry, two moles of carbon, six moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen all put together to get one mole of the molecules. <coughs> of this compound right so to get the molecular weight instead of the atomic weight you just add up the pieces so we can't go directly from liters to moles but we can go liters to milliliters and milliliters to grams so at this point the only way we have of getting the moles is with the atomic mass or molecular mass. All right, so going from liters to milliliters should be pretty comfortable with that by this point, right? Double check that you didn't divide by a thousand when you're supposed to multiply by a thousand, but other than that, not too tricky. And what do we do to go from milliliters to grams? We use the density and how are we gonna write it? Uh, 
milliliters. We do want milliliters to cancel out, but what is what are the units that are shown there? So that point zero seven eight nine is grams. For one milliliter. So milliliters on bottom, like we want it to be, and the 789 is on top. I guess before we do the next one, we should probably show our work for getting that molecular weight, right? So we've got for every one molecule of ethanol, we have two carbons. So two times the molecular are the atomic weight of carbon. So 12.011 grams per mole, plus six times hydrogen. Plus one times 15.999. And if your sig figs are a little off because you're using a different periodic table, that's fine. I think we get 44, 46, CO2 is 44. So that's gonna be 46 point, give me two more sig figs. Grams per mole. So how are we going to write that to get it? We want that on the bottom so we can cancel out grams, right? So we get 46.07 grams on bottom, one mole on top. Yeah, it's something like 18, maybe? What do we get for an answer when we plug all that in? 12. 12.18. 12. 12. And how many sick things we're going to keep? 12.84. How many are we going to keep, though? Three. Only three. All right, so bitter reviews might be feeling a little rusty since it's been a whole like week and a half since we've done some conversions. But hopefully this all feels fairly comfortable, even if you got hung up on one part here or there. Anybody have any questions before we go on? Great. I probably have said this before, but when nobody has any questions, I'm assuming it's because I'm going so so slow that this is all really boring to you. If I'm if the opposite is true and I'm going so fast that you don't even know where to start with your questions, you can feel free to just ask if we can wait for one more second and let you formulate a question as as well, or just make a note of it and not see me on break for uh, in office hours. Trying to figure out when to get on the top of the water. It sounds basic, but well, it's it takes practice. Um, it, you're absolutely right, but in the main thing is to watch out for is make sure it cancels out the unit that you want it to cancel out. Remember, you can arrange your your conversion factors however you want to, as long as the top is equal to the bottom. And if the top's equal to the bottom, then the bottom's equal to the top. So you can flip it however you want in order to make it cancel out the unit you started with. All right, or the unit that you currently have. If you if you pay attention to that, then you should be okay on most of the conversions. That won't lead you astray often if at all. So from that, let's go to something really basic that they teach in like first and second grade. Actually, I think more like I think my son came home from kindergarten talking about this one day. Um, so really basic stuff. 
but we need to define it in terms of science terminology so we know we're using it properly. Um, solids, liquids, and gases are pretty easy to qualitatively figure out, right? Almost anybody can look at something and say, oh, that's a solid, that's a liquid, that's a gas. But the actual definitions are, are actually pretty rigid. The definition of a solid means that you have a substance that has a fixed shape and volume. Anything that has a fixed shape and volume is a solid. Liquids, that's not quite the case. Liquids have a fixed volume within sig figs, but they have a, their shape can change. They still whatever container you put them in, but they still have a fixed volume. And then gas, neither of those is true. If it's a gas, it's neither a fixed volume nor a fixed shape. Jack? Then if space is a vacuum, what do you think in gas? It's a, it's a good question. The answer is space is not a true vacuum. It's a vacuum com compared to pressure on Earth. But actually, deep space has a measurable number of gas molecules sort of floating around. Um, and that's you know, one of the reasons dry, that could be driving the expansion of the universe is the universe is expanding to fill the shape of whatever container it's in, and it's not in a container, so it just keeps expanding. Sort of like if you pop a balloon, where do those air molecules go? Out. Right, you're no longer containing them, and so they expand. And the only reason that planets tend to have an atmosphere around them is just pure gravity. There's a gravitational attraction between the planet and gas molecules around it that keeps those gas molecules kind of stuck to the surface. Um, some planets don't have an atmosphere, and that's mostly because they also lack a magnetic field. And the sun is constantly blasting high energy radiation out of the planets. And if you don't have a magnetic field that kind of diverts those charged particles around the planet, then the, the atmosphere just sort of gets blasted off by the sun, the sun's rays, cosmic rays that they're called. Um, but if you do have a magnetic field, what you get instead is aurora borealis, northern lights or the southern lights which is the result of those cosmic rays interacting with the magnetic field around our planet. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field anymore. And so Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. I know it's the one to speak of. All right. So any questions about phases? Nobody's gonna ask, nobody's gonna say it. The one question I always get, Plasma. Plasma, exactly. Somebody always asks about what about plasma? I've heard about plasma before. Isn't there another phase? Um, the other one that I always get asked is, is it true that gap that glass is really a slow-moving liquid? Um, we'll address that one separately next. Um, plasmas are kind of a in between a liquid and a gas. A plasma is what you get if you take a gas and you force it to be so close together that the molecules are actually just as close together as they would be as a liquid. And so what you get instead, if you, if you put it in that really, really high energy environment, is you get a state where um, you're forcing all these atoms to be close to each other, but they all have so much energy that they can't even really hold on to electrons anymore. And so there's actually kind of a couple of phases. There's two different definitions. Um, one is a supercritical fluid is actually the more basic um, explanation. That's, that's sort of the more common case. A supercritical fluid means that you've got, you're at such high temperatures and pressures that, that your substance wants to be a gas, but you're forcing it to be so close that it's a liquid that behaves kind of like a liquid. So it's got properties of both. Um, and which is, that's not a true plasma though. A true plasma takes that even further and a plasma means that you have enough energy that your electrons are no longer stuck being in those orbitals around atoms. They're actually free to move around in between atoms sort of at random. And so that's actually what you get 
that's what the, the sun is a plasma. We can make plasmas here on Earth, but supercritical fluids are a little bit more common. Um, and they're actually not the only other phases. We're used to solid liquid gas, but there's actually lots of different types of solids. Um, technically, a, a superconductor is, a, is solid, but it behaves differently than regular solids. Um, and then you've got things like Bose-Einstein condensates um, that occur at really, really, really low temperatures. Um, all of this stuff put together means that solid liquid gas is sort of a simplified way of looking at it at the conditions that are common on Earth. We typically see only solid liquid gas. Um, and even that, we can get in and get really specific technically. So, for instance, carbon um, has uh, is solid at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Um, but it actually has two solid phases when it's pure carbon. Can anybody tell me what they are? What, how are you likely to find carbon in its pure form? Charcoal. Graphite would be more tech, or anthracene is another term for it, all mean basically the same thing. Or, Ariana? Diamond. Diamonds. Those are two different phases of the same stuff. You put it under different conditions, you get diamond versus graphite, um, but they're both solid. So really a lot of different substances have more than just one solid phase. Um, because, and you see the same thing with ice. Under different conditions, there are about 11 different phases of ice that you can have. Um, they don't actually behave the way that Kurt Vonnegut described them in Ice Nine, but it's, Ice Nine is a real thing that exists. Yeah. So when you're building a terrarium, you're trying to make sure the carbon is stable. Mm -hmm. Did you explain what that means? Mostly because carbon in its graphite or charcoal form um, reacts with other compounds, other organic compounds. Um, and, and the oxygen from the air in a way that breaks those other carbon compounds down. So basically, it keeps the smell down. Okay. Um, and it's safer than using use baking soda, but that's going to mess with the pH of things. And, and a lot of reptiles and fish really don't like when you mess with the pH of things. Um, that's why you can use baking soda and cat litter, but not the terrarium. So you use activated charcoal instead because it doesn't change that pH, but it still removes, in an aquarium, you use activated charcoal to remove a lot of things that cause cloudiness, a lot of proteins and stuff like that. In a terrarium, you'd be more, more likely worried about the smell. Um, and so that's probably why they, they have to be doing that. <coughs> All right. Um, and we'll talk about is glass a solid or a liquid another time. We'll move on from that. Short answer, it's a solid. Longer answer is more interesting though. Um, at least to me. So we have some ways of classifying types of matter as, as uh, different phases, solid liquid gas. The other thing we're gonna start talking about a lot is, well, that's if we have two different solids, what makes them different? And so part of the way we're gonna start talking about these, we need to be able to discuss whether something is a mixture or a pure substance, right? So this flow chart is sort of a way of understanding um, how matter behaves, how to classify matter really. Um, if it's if you have matter and that matter has a has constant properties and composition, meaning it's always the same, no matter what sample you get of it, it's the same. Then that means it's a pure substance. If it, if it doesn't have constant properties, then it's not a pure substance. It's a mixture of some, some sort. So, so there's really easy examples. Um, the easiest one to think about it would be like salt water. Does salt water have constant properties and composition? What could change about it? You can break you could, you could separate salt from water. That's one indicator that it might be a mixture. 
Yeah, the salinity level can change, right? You can have things that are more salty or less salty, but it's still salt water, right? The fact that you can change that property means it's not a pure substance, right? So salt water from Salt Lake is saltier than salt water from San Francisco Bay, which is saltier or which is not as salty as um, the salt water in the Gulf of Mexico. Right? The fact that you can have different levels of salinity tells you that it's not a pure substance. It must be a mixture. And then within mixtures, we have two different possibilities. And the line on this gets a little bit hazy, sort of like the line on phases gets a little bit hazy. Is it uniform throughout? If, if it's uniform throughout the entire sample that you have, do we say it's a homogeneous mixture? If it's not uniform, we say that it's heterogeneous. <laughs> so what's an example of a <clears throat> homogeneous mixture? Water. Water. Any type of water in particular? Distilled water. Distilled water. Is distilled water always the same no matter what? It is though. So distilled water is a good, that's where I was headed in a roundabout way. Um, distilled water is a pure substance because it's always the same. It's always just pure H2O. What could, if we added something to the water, we could add things that make it a homogeneous mixture versus a heterogeneous mixture. What could we add to make it a, a homogeneous mixture? Salt. salt, electrolytes, which is a fancy way of saying salt. Electrolytes in nutrition sense are basically a mixture of sodium chloride and potassium chloride so that you get the right ratio of sodium to potassium, which keeps your, your nerve cells communicating well. Um, but it's basically that's all electrolytes are, is salt. Um, it's just a good marketing term. Because you can say things like, it's what plants crave. Um, but uh, it's in ABC, you've been seeing ads for liquid IV lately. It says four times as many electrolytes as, as normal sports drinks. It, it's already been salty. I can't imagine that, that stuff tastes pretty good um, or is very good for you. Anyway, so salt, so anything that we would consider dissolving, really, right? You could add sugar. The water to make um, a simple syrup. That's going to be, is that going to be homogenous? If you get it all the way dissolved, right? What happens before it's all the way dissolved? It's heterogeneous for a little bit, right? Sugar sits at the bottom. Or if you got if you make tea and you put honey in your tea, the honey sits at the bottom, right? Even if it's starting to dissolve, there's still like that that last half inch of tea in your cup is going to be, have a lot more honey in it than the tea that you had at the top, right? Unless you're constantly stirring and keeping it homogenized. So it gets down to a little bit of semantics of how closely are we zooming in on this? If we have a pure substance, it always has the same properties in composition. Pure distilled water is always H2O. It's always the same ratio of hydrogens to oxygens, right? You can't change the number of hydrogens without also changing the number of oxygens, right? If you added more hydrogens to your water without adding more oxygens, it's no longer pure water. Now it's a mixture of water with something in it. Right, so if it's a pure substance, that means that the Elements that are found in it are always found in the exact same ratio. Okay, so I shouldn't use the word exact, but then say things. Sometimes there are impurities, but we still might consider that a pure substance. Um, if you've got a pure sim substance that you can simplify chemically, when you simplify it chemically, you break what that means is breaking it down into smaller pieces. then that makes it a compound. If it's made of more than one element, 
then you can separate those elements. You can take pure water and you can apply a voltage to it and you can turn that water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Those that's now as simplified as you can get it. You have pure oxygen gas and pure hydrogen gas. You can't simplify those anymore. Those are elements. But anytime you've got a mixture of elements as a compound, as a pure substance, it's going to be a compound. All right, so what other compounds do we see on a regular basis? Sugar, salt. salt. Those other things you've been using, pepper. Pepper is even more complicated because pepper is living cells. You can think of them as being mixtures. A living cell is a mixture of a bunch of different proteins and compounds, right? If you zoom in on it far enough, you know, ground pepper, if you grind it up fine enough, it might look homogenous at the macroscopic level, but you zoom in enough and you've got, you know, certain little pieces of it that have more um, capsaicin in it than the other side or other flavor compounds or other proteins, things like that. So anything living, is a mixture of compounds. And it's probably, if we're zooming in on it to that level, it's a homogeneous or it's a heterogeneous mixture because different parts of the cell, you're more likely to find DNA in the nucleus than you are in the cytoplasm, right? So that's fairly heterogeneous once we zoom into that level. But it does kind of depend on how we're thinking about this. What level are we considering right now? And that depends on your, on your context. Um, if I'm trying to, if I'm making spaghetti sauce, and I'm going to start by putting some olive oil and uh, crushed garlic in the pan, I'm not really going to make a truly homogeneous mixture by doing that unless I like put it in a food processor or something, right? But for the purposes of cooking, I can say that it's, you know, it's, it's homogeneous enough. Like, all of the oil has roughly the same amount of garlic taste in it once I'm done with that, right? So it depends on our context and what variables we're thinking about. All right, so here's an, just a, a, a diagram that looks at oxygen versus hydrogen in two different systems. So over here, we have a total of what is that, six waters? So that means six oxygens and 12 hydrogens. If we take a water molecule out, did we change the ratio of hydrogens to oxygens? No. How about over here? Still have six oxygens. But now we have 16. It really doesn't like what I try to write over there all the way on the side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, 16. Could we change that ratio of hydrogen to oxygen by only moving, moving around things that are already here? And we could take out an oxygen, right? Without changing the number of hydrogens. The fact that we can change that ratio without changing what pieces are in it means it's a mixture. The fact that over here, we can't change that ratio unless we break apart one of these objects means that this is a pure substance. And right, so this is a mixture of elements. This is a pure compound. Right, so we can kind of have almost like a, a Punnett square of ways we can combine these. You can have you can have pure versus mixture, and you could have compound versus element, right? right? And that is actually one of the ways that we can tell the difference experimentally between these is do we ever see this particular set up with a different ratio of atoms. So going back to our pepper analogy, are all peppers identical to each other? No, 
you know, you can even the same from the same plant, you can pick two different jalapenos that have wildly different levels of spice to them, right? That's an indication that that the capsaicin, the, that compound that gives peppers its spiciness, is present as a separate component. It's not one single compound in those jalapenos. My son just got to the age where he, he's starting to simultaneously approve of and grow in dad jokes. Um, and jalapenos are one of my favorite for, for dad jokes. What do you call a nosy pepper? Jalapeno business. <laughs> the other one that I get them, get them with all the time is um, if we're having having nachos, if we're sharing a plate of nachos, he goes to get a nacho. And I say, whose cheese is that? I don't know. Nacho cheese. I know it's bad, but it's so good. It's true. The effectiveness of the dad joke is directly proportional to the number of groans it induces. All right, let's classify each of these as compound, homogeneous mixture, or heterogeneous mixture, or element. If we went down to the lake and we grabbed a sample of water, is that a pure substance or a mixture? <laughs> mixture. It's going to have different things in it, right? Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? <laughs> It depends a little bit on how closely we zoom in and where we got our sample from, right? If I took my sample by grabbing a water glass and scooping right along the bottom at the beach, I'm going to get some sand and dirt and stuff in there, right? That'll be settling to the bottom. Anytime you can look at it, you can visibly see chunks of something that's definitely heterogeneous. But let's say I went out to the middle of the lake and I just took a glass right off the top. Is that homogeneous-ish? Heterogeneous? It depends on how closely we're measuring, right? Um, when I ask a question like this on the test, what I'm looking for is your understanding. So it, it, I'm not going to be grading on, did you say heterogeneous and I thought heterogeneous? If you say heterogeneous, you just have to be able to say, because this, because there's likely some, you know, diatoms floating on the surface of the water, or because as homogeneous because when you look at it, the top looks the same as the bottom. Those are both valid descriptions. And they're both right under different contexts. Distilled water, we already talked about. Compound, pure. Uh, until we start messing with the pH or allowing gases to dissolve in any way. Right away, at the, the normal level that we're used to thinking about, we call that pure water. A chocolate chip cookie. Definitely a mixture. If it's a chocolate chip cookie, it's, it's heterogeneous. A sugar cookie, you might think of as being on the surface close to a homogeneous mixture, right? Although we zoomed in far enough, we could see little air bubbles probably in the middle. Um, that would make it so, okay, well, you can make the argument it's really still heterogeneous when you zoom in far enough. What about milk? Heterogeneous. Those of you who are saying homogeneous, why? It's the same throughout. It's the same throughout. The bottom of the carton is probably the same as the top, unless you've got somebody drinking straight out of the carton on a regular basis, <laughs> in which case the bottom is not the same as the top, and you should throw it away. Um, so far, though. And they can call it, they sell it to you. They call it homogenized milk. You read the, the label, it says homogenized. But they're not talking about this. They're not talking about this. Is milk homogenous? Well, yes, but actually no. Um, it's If you zoom in far enough, the reason that milk is opaque is because it's got little fat protein droplets that aren't fully dissolved in water. It's a water-based mixture, but the, the fats don't dissolve in the water. And they form these little tiny droplets to scatter light. And those little tiny droplets are what make it opaque. Generally speaking, if you have a liquid that's opaque, it's not uh, a truly homogeneous mixture. You don't actually have anything fully dissolved when you have that. Um, whatever it is that you're trying to dissolve in it is not fully dissolved. Right? So if you try like um, a salad dressing, you have like a vinaigrette 
this kind of opaque, milky consistency. The separate components are clear. You can have um, a fat and a vinegar that are both clear, but when you mix them together and shake it up, it becomes this sort of opaque mixture, which is the same thing the milk is. It just might not be, have a stabilizer to keep it like that. So if you let it, if you do that, it'll then separate back out into its pieces. Which is why when you're making salad dressings, I always mix up which one it is. You always need to put some egg yolk, egg white, egg yolk. In Caesar especially, but most vinaigrettes have a little bit of what's called an emulsifier that basically makes it so it doesn't come back out and separate back out immediately. It'll stay as a more, it's basically what they do to homogenize milk if they add a little bit of an emulsifier to keep it from separating out into cream and um, skim milk. All right, let's take a quick break. Um, since we started a little bit later today, I guess we'll come back at quarter till and we'll talk about ionic compounds and how we can name them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to take it? Yeah. Yeah. It's right now. Yeah. You ready? All right. There you go. Thank you. Anybody else miss the quiz? I get everybody else. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. In fact, I can so that I'm right. Oh, Thank you. You might have just seen six spot. Yeah. Six exactly. again today. Today. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. No problem.
In theory, actually, this one's a lot. In theory, is it cold? It was said at 63, but it says it's 73. It does feel a little chilly on this side. Yeah. Well, about three weeks ago, it was put in here. It's 73. So, I don't know if it's sensory because I don't think it's 73 right here. No. <laughs> I, I have, I have this really beautiful I like it. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't have fish to get so what cost I I was in show again. Let's see the movie. You got the answer. I haven't seen it. You got to see the movie now. What was that? Uh, it's she, not the movie. Um, I said how the female with the situation in it. The last one in the movie. Which is like something if they like and the actual question that they do like uh, <laughs> I thought it was not true. It, it is. I am I am really bad at the you know the limits are actually like real things in science, not it does not exist. Yeah. yeah. Weird. It was, uh, yeah, it's like the natural laws, like science, where I've seen the paper about how I haven't solved the I thought it would be like So, any, any repeated, repetitive function like a sine wave is going to, if you take that out to infinity, it's not going to approach one single value, right? It's, it's, it, fluctuates up and down infinitely, right? Yeah. So if you say, okay, take it out to infinity, what is that value? You don't know because it could be anywhere from maybe one to all of them. So, right? so most things that have a, have a sine function and trig function in them are going to have a limit that does not exist at the first infinity. I think it was approaching yeah. like it's yeah. like, yeah. right. So if you yeah. put it inside a long other place, it's the do not exist. It is trying to take a long and negative number. So you can't take a lot of a negative number. And so since sine waves can't approach that, I don't know. So let's see if it makes sense to me. Under the natural log one minus x. So as x goes to zero, natural log of one should go to zero. But limit as sine of x goes to zero is also 
of zero. One minus cosine of x squared. Cosine of zero is one. We're dividing by zero. Zero minus zero is divided by zero. So this term from point to point to the limit of zero. But yeah, because we just find it by zero, which pulls you to study what's more and more. Yeah. Important to those ones that don't remember. Yeah. But that's what's going to be not this. Yeah. Yeah. Very about the people that all of that. Yeah. But we have a great idea how to pull out the problem. Yeah. It's not. 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 It's so we've been dealing with electron configurations. We've been talking about what ions are and how to identify what their electron configurations are and why certain ions are more stable than others. How can we usually, how can we predict ahead of time what's going to be a more stable ion? If an ion is going to be stable, what should probably be true about it? The valence shell, or at least an orbital. We should be only, if you're going to have a stable ion, it's because either your valence shell is all the way full, or at the very least, you filled up or emptied um, the uh, a orbital. So with that in mind, if you look at the periodic table, that allows us to predict what the charges are going to be on the stable ions for a lot of things. Right, so you talked you talked about that with Carl last week on your Thursday, right? Predicting charges based on valence electrons and based on electron configuration. So let's talk about what we get after we get those ions that are stable. What do we know about opposite charges? What do opposites do? Attract. Right. So if opposites attract, if we have if we have a an ion like a sodium ion with a plus one charge and a chloride with a minus one charge, they're going to be attracted to each other, right? They're naturally going to wind up sticking together because the positive charge is attracted to a negative charge. So that leads us to our first category of what kind of compounds we're going to be talking about, um, which is effectively. You can have a compound anytime you've got opposing charges. They're going to stick together, and they're going to stick together in a certain ratio. It's not stable to have extra positives or extra negatives floating around. For one, if you have, if we just had sodium floating around, it's got one electron in its valence shell. Right? So sodium 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, 3s1, right? It wants to try and get rid of that last electron, so it only has full energy levels and full orbitals, but it still has to have something that can take that electron. It's not going to just fire that electron off into space. There are a few elements that will do that, but basically just cesium and francium. Everything else will hold on to its electrons until it has something that can take the electrons from them. It's really, really unstable to have an unbound electron just floating around. On the flip side, if we had neutral chlorine, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p, sorry, let's look at fluorine just so I don't have to do a whole other row. Um, 2p5 for fluorine, right? When it's neutral. You can't have fluorine just sitting around and say, well, it'd be a heck of a lot more stable if it had an extra electron, right? But that electron has to come from somewhere. So we don't wind up with unbalanced numbers of charges, generally speaking. Under Earth-like conditions, we're going to have charges that add up to zero. It's going to be the most stable systems that you can have. They might be separated from each other by various means. But the overall charge for a system is going to add up to zero because the electrons have to come from and go to somewhere. So that means it's not just 
any combination of sodium and chloride that makes salt. It has to be a very specific combination of sodium and chlorine with a negative charge. How would we how would we have to arrange these if we want them to, their charges have to add up to zero? I mean, I don't mean physically arrange them, but what ratio would we have to have them? One to one. It's gotta be one to one. So we could have, we could have just a single, sodium ion and a single chloride ion, they're gonna norm, they're gonna want to stick together. But if we have more than that, that's still a one-to-one -one ratio, right? The charges still add up to, to zero. We can continue that indefinitely in all directions, right? So it doesn't matter how many sodium ions or chloride ions we have, as long as they're one to one, which makes it a pure substance, right? It has to be present at the same ratio, just like H2O. It's not, H it's not water if it's not two hydrogens for every one oxygen. And you can't change that ratio within sig figs. If you wanna get really, really picky about it, then you might have one or two extra sodium ions out of a mole worth of, of um, sodium chloride. But within sig figs, you can say that they're the same ratio. And so that means that this compound that we made is just dependent on what are the charges on the positive ion and the negative ion. And so if we actually take pure sodium, and if we zoom in on it all the way down to the atomic level, we basically just get stacks of, of these, these purple spheres representing sodium atoms. And they're just sort of arranged in a roughly, um, in a roughly square pattern. If we have chlorine gas on its own, we have a bunch of chlorine atoms floating around on their own. We can have these in any ratio we want. But once we combine them and let it form salt, sodium chloride, it has to be present at a one-to-one -one ratio. You have to alternate sodium ions and chloride ions to get, make these nice, neat patterns because you need the charges to add up to zero and you need all of the electrons to come from somewhere. All right, and so this process is what's called a, or uh, this, mixture when you have a solid like this is called a crystal and lattice and you'll you know there's a whole chapter on crystal structures um that you'll be probably the, in the first half of the next quarter where you can look at how do we actually approximate and talk about um something that is this really really huge repetitive structure that repeats in three dimensions um because we can't just draw out every single atom because then we wouldn't have time for anything else ever again in your life. Um, just one more example of how big a hole is. If you started, I think there's been more, if you count up every second since the Big Bang until now, there's fewer seconds in the universe up to this point than one mole of seconds. And if not, it's really close. So if you wanted to actually write out this structure, you, you know, you can't write the whole thing. So we have actually ways of sort of approximating, treating it like, kind of like a sine wave. A sine wave, you don't need to plot it going out to infinity to get an idea of what it does, right? You can just look at one certain area of it, you get an idea of what it looks like. All right, so we define these ionic compounds. Uh, we don't define them. The compounds are defined according to how they behave by looking at the smallest neutral combination of ions, right? So like I said, you could have any amount of sodium chloride, but it has to be in that one-to-one -one ratio. But we wouldn't write, if we're trying to write out what the, the structure is for, for the sample of sodium chloride, chloride we have, we wouldn't write 
Na two hundred and thirty one chloride two hundred and thirty one. We would say, oh, I've got two hundred and thirty one of each of them, because for ionic compounds we want the smallest ratio, smallest whole number ratio that gives you charge of zero. Right. So even though we might have two hundred and thirty one and two hundred and thirty one, we would only write it as NaCl or Na1Cl1. So for this combination, for sodium and sulfide, what's the smallest whole number ratio that adds up to zero? Yeah, we need, if we've got a plus one charge here and a two minus there, we need two of these for every one sulfur, right? If we have two sodiums and one sulfide, that's gonna add up to zero. We can't just go in there and change the charge to make it add up to zero though. Right, the charges are dictated by its electron configuration and where it is on the periodic table. So you couldn't just say Na2 plus and S2 minus because that doesn't exist. That is controlled by its electron configuration. It's dictated by, would be a better way of describing it. So if we have two sodiums for every one sulfide, we would write the formula as Na2S. And it doesn't mean that it's a distinct molecule. It's going to exist in one of those lattice structures, those crystal structures where it repeats indefinitely in all three dimensions. Um, but we write it like this, and we would still consider the molecular weight is still going to be based on this formula because this is the smallest whole number ratio that adds up to a charge of zero. All right. There we go. If we're going to name these, you may have noticed I keep saying I for like chloride, sulfide. That's because anytime you have an anion, and an anion is any ion with a negative charge, you can, the way that I remember is anion stands for a negative ion. Uh, and the way I remember that a cation is the opposite. So a cation is positive because the T looks like a plus ion. Silly, but it's effective. Um, some people always want to say, well, I like cats. So I'm just gonna remember that cations are positive. Sure, whatever works for you. Um, this is what works for me. A negative ion and cations look like a plus symbol. When we're naming these, the way we name them, first off, the way the way we write the formula is you always write the positive ion first, positive and then the negative. The good news before the bad news. Positives go first, so you would write the formula as Na2S, and that's the same way we name it. We name it by, by saying the name of the cation and then the name of the anion. In the name of the anion, we just change the end. We add i to the end of it. You drop the last syllable. There's a couple of regulars, but for the most part, you drop the last syllable and you switch it with I. So the name for this compound would just be sodium sulfide. All right, so the goal with these names is that anybody who knows the rules should be able to read your name and get the right formula from it. So do we have to do anything with respect to saying how many of each of these we have? Why not, Amiga? Because sodium when it's an ion is always plus one and sulfur when it's an ion is always minus two because of where they are on the periodic table. So we don't need to specify two sodiums for every one sulfide. It's in the name and the periodic table. And so the same sodium sulfide is everything we need to get to Na2S. And now that you've taken that quiz today, I'm never going to take away your periodic table again. So you don't even have to memorize them. The easy ones you're going to wind up memorizing. The ones we use all the time, you're going to wind up memorizing. But you can always go back to your periodic table and say, I don't remember what the charge on sulfur is supposed to be. What is the charge on sulfide? 
and you find it and say, oh, it's right here in oxygen. It needs to gain two electrons to be stable. Therefore, sulfide's a negative two. All right, and so it's the same process for every ionic compound. When you're naming it, it's just say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. Um, and one, uh, we're going to skip, we'll talk about hydrates in a couple weeks. We won't, we won't mess with hydrates for right now. All right. So for each of these, I've given you the chart on the ions, so you don't even need to consult your periodic table. Write the molecular formula and name the following compounds. And since we all have our symbols memorized now, you should be able to do that with consult without consulting your periodic table too. What's the formula for the first one? CaF2. It takes two fluorides for every one calcium ion. So the name would then be calcium fluoride, which incidentally for you environmental science geology people, I believe calcium fluoride is the primary component in fluorite, the mineral. I believe it's calcium fluoride, but I may be mistaken on that. Not a geologist. Um, how about aluminum? And oxygen. This is about as complicated as it could get, right? We don't have neither of them is a one, so that means we have to be we have to make sure we have the right number of each of them. So if you have if each aluminum has a plus three, and each oxygen is minus two, they have to add up to zero. So the lowest common multiple of two and three is six, right? Might be a terminology you haven't heard in a long time. Well, it's common multiple. But if we have two aluminums and three oxygens, they add up to zero. You have plus six from the aluminums and minus six from the oxygens. So Al2O3, which we would name as aluminum oxide. All right, there's an E there. What about zinc and oxygen? ZNO. ZNO? Not Z2O2? It's the same thing. It's the lowest whole number ratio. So yeah, ZNO. The reason I put this in here and I'm emphasizing this is because when I give you one like this, this is usually when somebody brings up or inherently uses that trick that they learned from their high school class that says, well, you just switch the two charges. You just take the two from up there and put it down there. You take that three and you put it over there. Boom, adds up to zero. That only works if you then reduce it to the lowest whole number ratio. Because if you do that here, you get Zn2O2, which is wrong. It has to be the lowest whole number ratio. So I don't like to use that rule because I would prefer you actually think about what you're doing. You're making the charges add up to zero because then it becomes really obvious. If you think about it that way, all you have to do is one zinc and one oxygen adds up to zero. And that means that we're going to have what? What's the compound's name? Zinc oxide. Zinc oxide. Easy enough, right? Nomenclature gets a, a reputation as being one of the harder things in this class, one that they um, easier things to mess up. Um, but this part of it's still pretty easy. Uh, if we go the opposite direction, what's the formula for lithium sulfide and magnesium bromide? Start by taking these and writing them like this. 
write down what the two ions are and then figure out how many how you need of each of them. So give you a second and we'll go through it. The lithium's right under, right above sodium, right? It's in that in column one that has one valence electron and it needs to get rid of. So lithium as an ion is going to be plus one. So that's what we're going to do next. First, I'm starting by just writing out these individually so we can see their charges. Sulfide we already used once, but if you didn't remember, look at your periodic table. It's in column sixteen, right underneath oxygen. It needs to gain two electrons to be stable. So if we have a plus one and a minus two, as Ronnie was saying, we need to add two there. We need two of the plus ones to add up to, so that the charge adds up to zero. So our formula would be Li2S. Magnesium bromide, magnesium is one column over, right? Magnesium has two valence electrons. It's in column two. So magnesium as an ion is two plus. It needs to dump those, it's in the third row, right? So it needs to dump those three S electrons. And bromide, same column as fluorine and chlorine. It needs to gain just one electron. So we need two of the bromides. So Mg, Br2. Easy enough, right? So why does no one think you get such a bad rap? Well, it's because all those transition metals. As we've noticed, the D block and the F block make, make things messy. Um, if you have a metal that can have more than one possible charge and be stable, you have to specify what the charge is on the metal. So if we know what the charge on the metal is, <laughs> We can figure out what the formula is pretty easily. What's the formula going to be for these two ions? We need two oxygens for every one chromium, right? So CrO2. It's another case where just switching the charges doesn't work, right? So you can use that approach, but then remember to reduce it to your lowest whole number ratio. Chromium can have, I think it's chromium is one of the ones that can have seven different possible oxidation states. It can have everything from being neutral all the way up to a plus five. If I'm remembering correctly, I might be thinking of manganese. Either way, it has a bunch of different oxidation states that we can have. So in, if we're trying to name it so that whoever looks at our name can write down the correct formula, we just specify the charge when we say this. It's still the same rules. It's still name the cation, name the anion. The cation in this case just needs a, a modifier, so to speak. So when we name this, we use what? Oxide. oxide. We're going to say oxide. It is a chromium oxide. We need to specify which chromium oxide it is. So it's chromium two, four. four. The charge on the chromium is plus four. And we usually write it as a Roman numeral. Um, but if you're hazy on your Roman numerals, I'm not going to mark you down if you write chromium. Chromium four like that, it's not technically correct. Um, because we use those numbers to indicate different things than the charge here. Uh, and most of the oxidation states where you're going to be doing this are going to, the most common ones are one, two, and three, which are easy for Roman numerals, right? Just think about action movie sequels from the 80s. They always had Roman numerals. Rocky IV, Rocky IV. The best Rocky. That's that's not true. Rocky one's the best Rocky. Um, but that's all there is. It's still the same rule. The rule is say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. Chromium four, chromium four altogether, that's the name of this ion. 
If we were talking about this ion specifically, I'd say we have a chromium four ion. Or I would say Cr4 plus. If you're going to say the charge directly like that, you have to use the, the symbol, not the name. So Cr4 plus, or the name of that ion is chromium four. Chromium four ion or chromium four oxide. Right? So in our um, there it is. In our periodic table, we had a list of ions that we always know the charge of, right? That were, so that was in last week's second lecture. This one. If it's a metal and it's not one of the ones that's marked here, then you need to use the Roman numerals for it. So basically, and remember that a metal, which I say remember, but we may not have ever officially defined this. Um, a metal is anything to the left of that stair step line. This stair step line right here, anything left of that line, that bolded line, is the metal. Anything to the right is a non metal. Technically, these blue are considered metalloids, but our hard distinction for the purpose of this class is that stair step line. Anything left of that is metal. And if it's, if it's in the first two columns, we always know when it charges. It behaves the way we're used to because the D orbital, if it has one, is all the way filled. If it's anywhere in the transition metals, other than our our little stair step of irregulars, those ones always have the same charge. Everything else that's left of this, we use the Roman numerals for. We just specify what the charge is. And even these ones, they're the ones that are most commonly used are aluminum, zinc, and silver are used all the time and always have the same charge. For the most part, in the real world, if you said indium free, you're not, nobody's going to correct you on that probably. Um, although every indium ion is indium free. So you don't have to say the charge if you know what it's always going to be. And remember with these, silver is always a plus one because it has one S electron to give up. Zinc and cadmium have how many S electrons to give up? Two. So these ones, when they're charged, are plus two. And then aluminum doesn't have any D orbital, so it actually behaves just the way we would expect. So aluminum's got what charge when it's an ion? Plus three. It's got three S2, three P1. So to become, new, so to become more stable, it gets rid of all three of them. And then you can use that same logic for these ones. They have a full D orbital, so you're not going to break it up. So plus one for silver, plus two for zinc and cadmium, plus three for aluminum, gallium, indium. You also want to think about it just in terms of there's one of them in this group. It's the plus one. There's two of them in this group. It's the plus two. There's three of them in this group. That's the plus three. Be one way to remember it. The main thing is if it's one of those or from the first two columns, we don't specify the charge. Everything else we do. So with that in mind, what's the name of the compound and the formula of the compound for the first one? HGF2, we need two of the fluorides for every one of the mercury two ions. So HGF2, and again, this is why we're so careful about our capitalization, because we want to make sure that when we write these formulas out, that we're not, we're not mixing up what elements we're talking about. And the name would be mercury fluoride would be the base, but we have to specify which mercury ion it is. So it'd be mercury two. 
<coughs> fluoride. What's our formula here? If we do two of those and three of those, it adds up to zero, right? So formula is Fe two O three. And our name is going to be iron three oxide. TIO. Just TIO, right? One to one because they're both a plus two or a plus two and a minus two. So our formula V T I O. And we'd name that as titanium two oxide. All right, and so I put this one in here specifically to illustrate. So there's two, two main points about these names versus the formulas that I want to illustrate before we finish for the week. One of those points is that the, the most common mistake that I see with this is that people try to use that to indicate how many you have. That's not what it's saying. You only have one titanium in the formula, right? but the charge on that one titanium is a plus two. So you have to remember when you say titanium two, that's talking about the charge, not how many you have. On the flip side, if you're saying the formula out loud instead of the name, then those numbers are talking about the subscripts. They're talking about how many you have. So I could say iron three oxide, or I could say Fe2O3. But if I say the word iron and oxide, that means I'm using this system and the three is talking about charge. If you say the symbols, then you're talking about the formula and the sub and the numbers that you say out loud are indicating the subscripts or how many you have. That's the trickiest thing to keep track of when we start introducing these, right? So iron three oxide or Fe2O3, not, iron two oxygen three that'd be the incorrect way to say that or people always want to say like dye iron trioxide don't do that we only use that those prefixes when we have a covalent compound which we'll add next week All right so no prefixes always just with these these two systems all right any questions before i turn you loose all right, I have office hours till four. If anybody does want to come find me for questions, I'll be down in my office or right here. I think it's real quick. Sorry, remember you put a regular for the weekend quiz as well. Sorry, we have two quizzes one for and the regular one for over the weekends. Thank you.